It's finally, we're back. It's time for another Wrestling Perspective podcast. We have a lot to get to in this intro. First of all, happy birthday, Lars. What Thank you. 42 you, now? 43? Not, yeah, not, I don't look a day over 50. All right, all right. Uh, eight minutes before this podcast, I had a big burly beard, but in honor of Chavo, I went with the mustache. So nice. uh, I figured since we've emailed each other more than I've emailed any person on earth, I'm either going to be an honorary Guerrero by the end of this uh, podcast <laughs> or your best friend. So I I just want to look like you. So, you know. Right. Nice. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I could be cool. Ringo Guerrero. How about that? Ringo Guerrero. <laughs> Tomas Guerrero. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Hey, sure you it. know, the, 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 I mean, obviously you guys are road guys, you know, it could have happened. Hey, we got a lot of Guerreros out there. So I'm sure we got somebody out there for sure. So I'm okay with that. So yeah, I figured, you know, I probably have 180 no, Guerreros from you. So we're like BFFs now. Exactly, exactly. Cool. So, Lars, uh, you're yes, back sir. from the UK. We're finally recording a podcast. I know. Chavo's is, our first is, guy back. Is, I mean, this is a wonderful way to, to kick it back, uh, you know, start it back up again. I mean, one of my favorites is here, you know, I one hell of a performer, tag team specialist, singles, you name it, this guy's done it all. But I digress. Yep. Phenomenal <laughs> actor. He was in my favorite comedy, uh, TNA. <laughs> thank you finally okay i'm glad that's fucked up like, no, 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 it's pretty good <laughs> my Ooh. favorite comedy if that's your favorite comedy bro then you've got a very warped sense of humor <laughs> <laughs> well you know what i'll lead off the questioning here and uh i do want to touch on your acting where you you've got the rock and cena doing all the acting and, and moving out of the wrestling and i've heard many interviews where you talk about your love of wrestling when you're like kind of transitioning, because nobody can be a wrestler forever, is, does it break your heart a little bit having to kind of transition into acting and away from wrestling? Well, so I'm not really acting. That I'll leave that to Cena. I'll leave that to Batista. I'll leave that to you know to Rock. I'm the one making all the shows. So I'm uh, I. It's more of a passion now, dude. I was on TV for 20 years. I'm cool. I'm good with it. Now I'm literally the one creating something. So I'm actually. On the show, for instance, uh, Young Rock that I'm doing, we're getting ready to go back to season three in a, in a week. Uh, I'm, you know, all everything wrestling goes through that. I mean, script supervision. I'm, I'll read all the scripts and say well, that's just right, that's wrong. Uh, I'm talking about not just choreography of the matches, but set design, uh, wardrobe. Every, I mean, anything wrestling really kind of goes through me. So, um, uh, Brian Gortz, who was a uh, head writer of Raw for a long time, is also executive producer. So between he and I, we just, you know, we'll call up Dwayne and say, hey, <laughs> what about this? What do you think about that? You know, so it's uh, anything wrestling on it, man. So I I'm pretty busy. It's pretty good. Well, you you know, you've obviously your family, you, you know, it's it's no it's no secret who they are and generations upon generations of wrestlers. And you've seen so many transitions in the wrestling business. Right. And I think over the last, you know, I would say four years, we've seen sort of a a, 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 a dawning of a, of a new golden age. I mean, you have so much to choose from. There's so many ways to consume professional wrestling. I always wanted to, you know, from someone who's been there for a long, long time, what's your take on what's happening currently in wrestling? Are you, are you, uh, are you sort of dumbfounded that there's so much out there to see now? Or are you kind of like, well, there's too many work. I mean, you know, so many people had so many different opinions. I'm just kind of curious about yours. So my, no, I, I, I love, I love the resurgence of wrestling. It's a great time to be a wrestling fan right now. There's not just one, you know, one show in town, like there was for a while now between, you know, AEW and not, not just WWE, but NXT and, you know, the European shows and new Japan pro wrestling, and MLW. Um, God, there's so much. It's really, really cool to be a wrestling fan right now you know there's so much variety out there and there's so much young talent it's really really cool to uh just just to watch it you know i'm a, i'm still a big fan and i still love watching it and uh you know I'll, I'll, of course i'm one of those older guys that go oh well back in my day <laughs> but still it's really really cool to see these guys kick butt man and uh you know they're, they're just incredible athletes they really are i'm glad you brought up back in your day because for me, it feels like you might have been that first generation of wrestlers that didn't end up broke and hurt. And how did you 
you know, figure that out because you were kind of right there on the precipice where, you know, depending on who you were, you could have gone either way. We could have been talking to Chavo in the apartment next to me right now that, you know, how, how did you learn how to take care of, of your outside the work business? You know, I learned from, I learned from my family. I learned from the mistakes they made, you know, the times that they were thinking that, you know, wrestling was always going to be there, always providing. And, um, you know, you can only, I, I had a, talk with triple h one time i said man you can only borrow it for so long and then you got to give it back you know so you hope you can still stay involved in wrestling um you know with some capacity but you know it's not always the case so you really got to invent yourself again and um not be scared to kind of say goodbye to wrestling and uh, a lot of people can't do that and that's why i think they end up a lot of times broken you know, like the movie, The Wrestler and still wrestling in front of, you know, an auditorium and stuff because, you know, or high school and stuff because they're, they're you know, like, like, look, first, my dad loved him to death, but he was a, you know, he had his, he had a teaching credential. He was a high school teacher and coach and a couple of times went back to that. But every time that wrestling called, you know, he would leave that and go back to wrestling. I was like, dad, what are you doing? I go, that's your, you gotta just keep it's maybe not as glamorous but you got a pension you got insurance you got retirement you got all that stuff i go uh, you don't get that in wrestling you know he loved wrestling so much he would always just leave it and go back you know so i was, I was always just like ah oh, man you know just I, I just learned a lot from them so i saved a lot of my money um you know you enjoy the fruits of your labor a little bit also you know i you know i bought bought some cool cars and bought a couple cool things but um, you know, I really, I didn't keep upgrading the house. I didn't get divorced 10 times. You know, I, you know, I'm still married to the same girl. That's what we did. Time. We made that mistake, the divorced one. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, I mean, I, I mean, every, there's just circumstances for everybody, you know, but, um, I think that's just what happened, man. I just kind of just stuck with it, you know, and, uh, you know, put the kids through college and kind of just, uh, it's been, you know, it's you're a little lucky too, <laughs> you know? Well, you know, one of the things I've been wanting to ask, because out of an, 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 you know, insane tragedy, Vicky Guerrero is is pretty much been like one of the best heels, right. you know, managers in the last 20 years. I mean, and I know that she's, you know, obviously she's a family member to you. Did you ever see that, that she kind had that potential? Kind well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but you know, I mean, yes. But, yeah, um... Did you see that she had that potential? No, 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 nobody really did. And she just kind of uh, stepped up to the plate and really kind of did it really uh, on her, you know, kind of on her own. I mean, we all kind of looked out for her a little bit, but, um, you know, she just, she hit the right time and she was, you know, kind of the most, most popular heel in WWE for a minute, you know? So, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, more power to her for sure. She, at the same time, she kind of had to reinvent herself also, you know, her husband and her, you know, moneymaker, was gone so she had to figure out something to do and she figured it out would would eddie have wanted her in the industry mm, i don't think so because just he knew how the industry was you know mm. it's a tough industry it really is and it'll eat you up and spit you out and it, and it's and it does and i've talked to vicky a couple different times and it it's you know she's got some good stories of being eaten up and spitting out by some higher ups up there you know so um I don't think so, man. I, I don't think he would want would have wanted his daughter in it. She was in it for a little bit. Um, I can't say that he would have fought her on it, but I think he would have, you know, tried to steer her into a different direction. Just I wouldn't want I didn't want my kids into it, you know. I thought, and I'm a third generation pro wrestler. If they wanted to, different story. But you know, I really was like, like I just know there's a lot of second, third generation pro wrestlers out there that are out of work and are just always chasing it. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's tough, man. You gotta be cut and ready. For, you got cut from that cloth to just God, just to be ready. You know, you large, you, you're the music industry. It's tough, man. It's a hustle. It's a hustle. And if you're not, you're not, uh, cut out for it, man, it, it, it'll eat you up. Well, and the reason why I mentioned Vicky is because every time I've seen her, she's always remembered me and she's always super nice. Yes. Um, but one of the things I, I do want to uh, to ask you, um, you know, like you said, there's like this performer thing that's inside you that's obviously runs through your your bloodline. OK, True. I mean, it's I think it's something that's just hereditary. I mean, um, 
Now, like what you were saying as, as far as your children and, and so you're, you're not the type to encourage. It's more, it's more about finding it for themselves. Now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my, my family didn't encourage it either for me. It just, uh, that was our business. That was how we did everything through wrestling. So, uh, well, did you feel an oblig like an obligation? Well, so, you know, because I grew up and, you know, that's the way we fed our family was through, you know, my grandfather did, my father. So we just lived, breathed, ate wrestling. Um, so that's all I wanted to do. That's all me and Eddie wanted to do was follow in their footsteps. With me, I tried not to bring that home the whole time. Although they were still, you know, they would, you know, wanted, you know, to dress up like me and go to the matches and stuff. I tried not to just be that my own, have wrestling my only identity. You know, I tried to just be kind of dad when I got home, even though it might have been two days a week or whatever. Um, you know, I really didn't, talk wrestling around them too much and stuff and you know you it's always there but at the same time once they started kind of so showing interest in school and and different things i kind of pushed that and i was like guys use your brains use your brain you know i got i talk, i've had this conversation with them i got really lucky i got you know there's uh you know for me to be a you know college dropout go to going to wrestling um and then now transitioning into hollywood and becoming pretty good at what i'm doing in hollywood i go i'm i'm, I'm an anomaly it just, it just doesn't happen so i go i got lucky man <laughs> i wouldn't wish that for you guys at all i kind of put all my eggs in one basket and uh, it paid out but it could easily not where are you at in your career now is your in ring career over have you retired i i know this is a loaded question but I, it's i feel like it's something where you are now maybe it's kind of should be asked you don't ever retire i mean a guerrero's never retired <laughs> it's the truth you really really don't so when i see like rick flair's retirement match i'm kind of like which one is this you know come on <laughs> you know you just really don't ever retire you're always involved in wrestling so everything i'm doing now is still wrestling it's just a different a different avenue with my you know my uh uh movie making career tv making career uh my beer i have a beer out that's you know kind of off offshoot of wrestling that's you know, I got cigars coming out. I got, I just kind of have, Hi. I got, I got a whole thing. It's all kind of stems off my old wrestling career, but whether I'm doing a comic con signing or whether I'm doing a cameo or whether I'm doing different, you know, it just, it's all really stems off of that still, but I'm not getting punched in the face anymore. So to your question, you know, I don't think I'll ever really retire, but I, I, you know, I, I just, I don't, I wrestle maybe three, four times a year now, you know, it's not really big huge wrestlemania matches because i know right where i need to be at but i keep myself there in shape ready to go at all times so any match that i have you know the guys are always like what the hell dude you're still out performing all of us and i'm like i just don't do it 300 days a year anymore so i can do that well you know it's interesting that you say that one of the things i kind of wanted to get your opinion on or at least your take on over the last couple of decades, I've been fortunate enough to to visit different locker rooms, you know, at different times and different right. periods. Last time I saw you on TV was an AEW event. Right. I'm, I'm curious to know, how do you think that locker room has changed? Because, you know, you obviously have different generations and, and different ways of thinking. Um, what do you think is the biggest change between, let's say, you know, a locker room from 10, 15 years ago to like right now and how things are handled? Uh, 10 or 15 years ago, we still had like the older regime there. So like when I was, we were, you know, we were learning from the best, man. When I, my teachers were you know, not only Eddie, Dean and Chris, but it was, you know, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Mr. Perfect, uh, Steve Regal, Dave Finley, uh, I had some of the best, some of the best teachers that were still teaching me the way that they that they knew how to do it. Now, what I think is happening is that a lot of those guys are kind of gone now. So, I mean, sometimes it's like I think who's teaching the 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 younger guys, the younger younger generation. It's guys that were here that were ten years ago, you know. So, um, you know, wrestling, you know, you used to do it for twenty years. Now you're you're doing it like for like. 10 and then you're out you know so it's just it's just changed you know so i i just hasn't been that passed down like it was before so that's why i think the locker rooms are definitely different you know i mean now you're um and it's hard man it's hard to say you know it's just they're it's just, it's definitely a different breed 
you know, um, you know, the times have changed also social media changed everything, camera phones changed everything. So everybody's much more careful in what they're doing than opposed to 10, 15 years ago when we were 20 years ago when we started, you know, so, um, you know, that dynamics change. And I, like I say, it's probably very similar to music a little bit, you know, <laughs> you, you know, those old guys, they, you know, they didn't, it was a wild west when they grew up. They didn't care about anything. And, you know, they would tell Vince McMahon to F off and quit. And now these guys are kind of on eggshells all the time. You know, if, uh, you know, somebody says jump, they're all like, hi, how high? When we were, you know, well, at least the generation that I came from, they were always like, if they were told to jump, I was like, whoa, 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 why are we jumping? What are we doing that for? You know, and it's, 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 it's a little bit of it just changed now. I don't, I don't, you know, it's times change. So, I, I, I don't ever like to compare too much of the generations. Times change, wrestling changes, you got to change with it. Just like music changes, you got to kind of change with it to stay relevant. And I, I just feel that um, it's it's changing. I don't know, it's changing maybe in a way that I'm not liking as much. You know, uh, like I always say, these guys are much better athletes than we were. They could do a bunch more things. But sometimes they're doing things and they don't know why they're doing them. They're just doing them to do them. You know? So that's the, that, that's the key, right? Is telling the story. And I feel like that's almost a lost art. And those are the things that I think that you learn from the older generation. We, so we tell that, stories that, in the ring. Exactly. And I, and I do, every time I do a seminar, or I talk to young people, that's what we do. We tell stories and we use the moves. We use the explosions to tell, help tell the story, but those moves themselves are not the story. So, so I think that's what's getting a little bit of lost art a little bit to where they're just doing Canadian Destroyer and Super Kick and a backflip just to do them when sometimes, like I, I use, use Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio, when he first started, could do a lot more stuff than he can now. But he's so much of a, so much better of a wrestler now because he does what he does. He does less stuff, but he does them right at the right time. And it just makes all the difference in the world. Randy Orton, Randy Orton, I think he's to me one of the best out there, the best, you know, definite Hall of Famer. He does like five moves, but he does them right. Man. He does it at the right time and it's perfect timing. And it makes it makes all the difference. It makes his matches amazing. So just because you can do a backflip doesn't mean you should do a backflip. None of us can do one, by the way, here. So <laughs> I just throw that out. I, I'm gonna get a little heavy on this question because you've talked about your love for wrestling and it's well documented the losses that you've had in wrestling. How do you still keep your love for it with everything that's happened to you? Man, I grew up in wrestling. We've had losses our whole my whole lives, and that's just how wrestling was, you know. So it's if you think about it, wrestling, you know, the the if you want us the dark side of wrestling, that's five percent of wrestling. Ninety-five percent of wrestling is awesome it's amazing so um you know you just kind of think about that part yeah you know there's definitely some tragedies in it but it's it's hollywood it's rock and roll it's everything combined you know so you're gonna you're gonna have some things in there that just sometimes you know like i said eat you up but uh you know the majority of wrestling's pretty awesome I, I do have a follow-up question. And with this new breed of kids, do you think, and, and I think I kind of see it, but I don't want to like assume, but are, are we seeing less of those tragedies now with the way these kids are doing, you know, video games and not drinking and whatnot. And that's awesome that I love that. That's one thing that I really like about this new generation that they're not dying. <laughs> you know, they're not dying. They're not ODing. They're not getting hooked on pills. They're not getting, you know, they're not being alcoholics. You know, we still got a couple of them beating wives, but still at the same time, you know, that's <laughs> a bit. But, uh, you know, uh, that's that's really great. I hope that continues because, um, uh, you know, that that's a part of the old school that we definitely have to lose, you know. You know, things happen so freaking fast. Right. You now, I started thinking as we were all talking, like, Vince McMahon no longer runs the WWE. Crazy. You know what I mean? That's fucking crazy. crazy to me, right? Like never in a lifetime would I ever think. And now never. that, and what the funniest part is, is now that product is actually watchable to me now. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's the fucking truth. Um, and then I you have that. just so much drama out there. And we're not like a dirt sheet podcast. And, and sure. But, I, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, as far as like the way that this news breaks and it's like, everybody's got a fucking opinion or they think they know it's the truth. And 
you know, the wrestler is literally sometimes the last to answer to it or say something about it. I mean, you know, and I, I see that in a current situation that's happening now. And it's in, and I'm wondering from your perspective, like, you know, what, what do you think the biggest difference is on the boys handling their differences these days? I almost feel like it's a little bit more backstabby. Yeah, they're surviving. Yeah, they're not doing drugs and playing video games. But, and I maybe, and I'm just saying this as a, 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 like just a, an observation, but is it, a, is it like an entitlement thing to you? Did, do you see that? Is it something like that? It's a different generation. It's a different generation. That's it's kind of what it is. You know, I can't say back in my day, but it's even the guys before us. So yeah, a little bit of my time, but really before, you know, you you handled a grievance. You had a you handled a problem with your fist. You got in the, in the you went into the locker room and you you dealt with it, and and people respect each other for it. Now uh, it's kind of like a the situation that you're talking about. I think kind of doesn't happen now. People are <laughs> you know they're bitching and complaining and going to the brass and you know saying this is an unsafe working environment and i'm like guys are you guys just playing wrestlers on tv or are you guys wrestlers because look i always say it in like the 80s my dad's era that there was no mma wrestlers were the toughest men on the planet period that's just the way it was you didn't even get into the business unless they they you know they could prove that you were you were tough enough to to be in this business and now it's kind of in a sense, and, and it's okay, it's no big deal, but at the same time, you're still pro wrestlers and you're still portraying this image. And I think now if you you know if you can't handle yourself, I think you're almost doing a disservice to the to the business. And what I see a lot of times on TV, not all the times, but what I see is people playing pro wrestling instead of pro wrestlers, you know. We used to be like our line was really close you couldn't tell if we were serious or not because we, we were we walked that line really really close um when my dad for example my dad first came back into wwe and he came in as my manager or actually came in and helped me turn on eddie and kind of that stuff well they brought him in for one shot and then like three weeks later you know he kept they kept bringing him back because he was doing really good in three weeks later we got to to smackdown and the main event of smackdown the tv show was uh eddie and kurt angle versus me and my dad so he, i was still I thinking remember that. that yeah i was i was uh you know childhood travel classic from you know the 1980s so i was like like let's go let's go take care of it and then he was kind of like he was nervous he was like oh my god i have a rough <laughs> and i'm like ah, don't worry about it we got it we got it you know we were just such on a high level we went in the ring and you know we were going for it when we got done i feel bad because we should have taken care of him a lot more than we did I just, <laughs> true but afterwards, he came in the back. He said, God, you guys are like, you're three-quarter shooting out there. You know, and if you guys know wrestling terminology, shooting is for real and work is yeah. is not. He goes, you're so close to actually, you guys are like freaking like Japanese style going for it. I'm like, no, we're not. And he's like, yeah, you are. That's, that's how close we were at all time. We were expected to perform the highest level. And if we didn't, that person in the in the ring would eat you up. Chris Benoit would eat me up if I didn't. Oh, yeah. Kurt Angle would be, be the crap out of me. Um, guys like you know Bradshaw and um, um, and uh, uh, Ron Simmons, you know they 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 weren't taking it easy on you. you know they were like trying to rip your head off, so you had to bring it back. But it showed where that mutual respect was in that ring. I think that's not too much there anymore. I think guys are kind of uh, uh, it's there, but it's not there. Like I said, there's everybody's kind of playing in the ring and just having fun which is great i enjoy it but god our professional kurt our professional um um what do you want to say our we're trying to outdo each other every single night we're getting in that ring and you had to earn it i was going to give you anything you had to you had to earn it Cena you should tell the story when he was tagging against me and eddie one time and he was like chavo and eddie were the boss in there and and you knew it because they they were continually were were explaining that to you in there. And we were, you know, I mean, it's like, Hey, I mean, we didn't sacrifice the match for at the same time. We had that integrity of that match that we had to live up to. So you, you, you better bring it. Well, I feel like, you know, just to follow up, it's like, that's how the cream sort of rises, right? It's like, you got to bring, especially in that dynamic, when it's something so quick, maybe you're given a certain amount of time, you got to rise your opponents to make it seem like, 
this is a legit battle. Am I am I mistaken or am I correct? Well, look, like I mean, I was always taught that okay, so these people, okay, so let's make it look like this is an analogy I use sometimes. It's like magic. So Chris Angel, right? Chris, we all know it's an illusion. David Blade, and it's 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 a, it's a it's an illusion. But the second Chris Angel starts levitating, you're like, oh man, what is he doing? This is holy shit, that's crazy. How did he do that? I said, I know this is not real, but that how did he do that? The second you see the string, you're like, oh, okay, okay, change the channel. I know this is a work. Well, the same thing with wrestling. It's you never want to let them see the string, but the second you right. do that that wrestling punch, or you know something that's a little too hokey that really wouldn't have happened in in real life um you're kind of you know the people they want they know it's not real it's 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 a it's a, it's a work it's entertainment but the second you make them forget about that and they believe like you know i know rusty's not real but those guys were really kicking each other's asses then you got them you you suspended their belief but i, I don't see that happening a lot of times you know now it's just so many really cool awesome moves but yeah they're kind of like ah oh, this is ah, it's not real but I, I I I loved like see the Steiners in there going and bringing it. Oh. Okay, uh, this may not be real, but those guys are real. You know, you could <laughs> tell. You know, what I mean, you could just tell. Um, you know, I there's always that room for, you know, having, you know, like a somebody. I just posted something today. Would repost Snoop Dogg's post that where I was in the room with him. There's always those things when you're gonna have Snoop and you're gonna have to take care of him and do stuff like that. I get it, but then there's also those times in where you know, people, they believe it, you know, like I, I met, I'm doing that young rock show. And uh, the first time I met Brett Azar, who plays the Iron Sheik, he, um, I was on a plane, we're flying to Australia the first season. And of course, he looks exactly like the Iron Sheik. So I said, Hey, so obviously you're playing the Iron Sheik, right? And he goes, Oh, yeah, yeah. I go, Hey, I'm the wrestling coordinator. And he was like, he was like, Oh, oh, nice. What, what's your name? And I said, Chavo Guerrero. Or I, I go, sorry, he goes, did you used to be a wrestler? I said, yeah. He goes, what was your name? I said, Chavo Guerrero. And he goes, oh my God. He was like, I effing hated you. He was like, I hated you. Like really hated you. When you broke Rey Mysterio's knee, I was like, I, I like literally had prayed for your death many times. And I was like, I was like, really? And he's like, he was like, man, you just did your job so well. I got to hate. I, they believed that I was right. this like, despicable person. And you, you, you know, you want to you gotta we gotta keep doing that we gotta keep people believing like that teetering like hey you know i know russ is not real but that but man that i think those two were really fighting or i think jericho's really he's really a he's really a jerk you know something you know and i i don't sometimes i see that it's not there all the time you know um the, but there's some flashes like it like mgf is doing a really good job and oh yeah i like i love him as a person he's a great guy but Man, on he sing, comes off as such a douche when he talks. It's it's awesome. I love it. You, I, I have to touch on your your managerial role, which did not last long enough for me because I really enjoyed watching you progress as a manager, wow. which was way different than who you were as a wrestler. And you've been around forever. Your career has been, you know, I guess touched by many Hall of Famers and many great guys along the way. So, who kind of taught you how to be a manager? And is that something you can might want to do more in the future? Or are you happy where you are? Yeah, you know, um, being involved in wrestling is always really cool. So that all came about where Tony brought me in. It was kind of on a daily type thing. Um, you know, I was doing stuff with with Andrade, and uh, um, I got the up. You know, I, I didn't know when I was going back to Young Rock. Season two called and said, "Hey." okay, we have our dates as we're coming back. So I had to talk to Tony and said, look, I know we're doing right, we're doing well here, but you know, I I don't think you can match what they're paying. And I think it's probably better for me to go do this. So he was like, no problem, no problem. Okay, so let's, you know, write you out of the storyline really quick. And then, um, you know, I had Andrade turn on me. And then we had all the plans of me coming back. I mean, up until like two or three weeks of me coming back, I mean, leaving Young Rock, I mean, we were still talking on the phone and then like Tony does, he went silent. So when he went silent, I said, okay, what's going on? So that's kind of like, we're, we're always going to come back and pick up right where we left off. And it just, it just didn't happen. So back to your question, um, you know, I always, if it can work out with my shooting schedule, then absolutely. I love being involved in wrestling. It's, it's still my passion, you know? What are the who are the oh God, go ahead. I was gonna say, can you can you talk a little bit about who you, who you draw inspiration from as a manager? 
as a manager, gosh, you know what? I mean, it'd be the old school managers for sure. Not just the people that were just, um, you know, figure pieces. I like the guys that actually got involved and actually really kind of helped their clients in a sense, you know, where they'd be tripping people or taking the heat, getting, you know, getting the punch while the other person wins. Like I love, I love that old school style of managing for sure. You know, so anything with like a, you know, Captain Lou or a, a Freddie Blassie could get all the heat, you know, in the world. Um, you know, um, God, there was, you know, even guys like Harley Race, you know, when he came back and did stuff, it was, it was cool. I, I enjoyed it. You know, Mr. Perfect did a great job when he was doing stuff with Ric Flair. You know, it just was just being like, you have to add to the, to the match and add to the storyline. And if you don't, I think you're just walking the person out. You're just a valet. Well, you know, I got to be brutally honest. I hated you with Andrade because I thought I wanted to watch you. I, you know, I didn't really want to watch him. And I honestly think that, you t you know, my personal opinion, I'm just going to say it, is that you took a lot of shine away from him because you're fucking Chavo. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm <laughs> we, sorry. We, we talked about actually, I mean, the, the plan was for me to- You would, you would like, you, you would try to pull back and I'd be like, uh-uh, that guy needs to come up front. See, that's the thing. It's like, it, I, anyways go ahead you were talking about I, I, I hear you i hear you, you know it's 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 hard you know we've been in the game a while we, we know some good tricks and uh you know uh you know I, like i said i've been taught i had some really good teachers so um you know it's hard for us sometimes not to steal try to steal the spotlight and uh you know just just take a step back because we're so used to being larger in life and just put the camera on and let me take over so uh, I, I hear you i hear you on that i've, I've had i've well, had people have told me that <laughs> well you know there's not a lot of guys like when i think of your generation of wrestling it's like right before the generation of like i mean i guess jericho is kind of this around the same time as Absolutely. you you know and he's still wrestling christian obviously still wrestling edge is still wrestling punk is kind of you know as you you know came in while you were still going right. pretty strong and i was thinking there's really not a guy like you in in aew like in your generation where you were kind of like yes you're old school but you're you're not old enough to be old like a rick flair right. or a, a jake the snake or a tolly blanchard or yeah you're up there with those guys right but why do you think it's guys of your ilk that are 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 not really in, in that in that in that arena because i mean you know, you're obviously doing, you know, stuff for TV shows. Rock has moved on now to 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 TV and to Hollywood. Same with Cena. But it's like when I think, of, you know, you guys, you guys would probably be the perfect ones to be that generation. And that's mm -hmm. where I hold you is in that generation would be the perfect ones to be the the the, the sort of the producers, these guys here, you know, the handlers. Why do you think a lot of your generation is just no longer there? Great question, man. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't run the companies, but uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe the guys are who's running the companies are kind of losing in the shuffle a little bit. And like you said, with WWE, now that Vince is gone, I'm definitely going to think it's going to change and you're going to see um, it really flourish. I believe it's going to really just go to new heights just because, you know, um, <laughs> you got guys that care <laughs> that, that aren't just a billionaire. They're actually there to, you know, make great TV. Uh, so I, I think, um, I hope at least, I think that's going to be really good. So you never know. Maybe it'll, maybe I'll pop up. <laughs> Let's hope so. You know, in Hollywood, wrestlers that become actors, there's always this weird stink on them, right? You can never wash off pro wrestling off an actor. I think maybe The Rock has transcended that. Cena, maybe not saying they're bad, just that you, you never quite get out of the pro wrestler mold for you as a producer. Do you still are an on-site coordinator? I guess. Do you still feel like you, you have that same, same stink on you? Do you have to overcome that to, to prove that you belong where you are? So, um, I, th this is the thing back in the day, wrestling was looked differently in Hollywood. You know, if you're a wrestler and you had to do movies, it's probably like they didn't get it. Now they get it. They understand that John Cena, that The Rock, that Batista are huge box office stars that are really good at what they do. And people are paying money to see these guys. So um, that stigma, I think, is leaving now. And all of a sudden, Hollywood's realizing, like, wow, these wrestlers, they're not only really talented, they're, they're actually 
they people they they sell tickets you know so um i don't think that stigma actually goes to them anymore when you look at rock he doesn't you're not you're like oh yeah he used to be a wrestler Cena is kind of the same thing, you know, Batista is kind of, you know, kind of getting out. There's a lot of people that didn't know Batista as Drax and they don't know him as, as you know, the, the, the animal in, uh, in, um, in WWE. So um, I, I think that stigma is really leaving and everybody's not that they're trying to change it. I just think that their, their work is speaking for itself and it's changing it all. So with me, uh, definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not, People like everybody in Hollywood think that's still oh, that's so crazy. That's so awesome that you were pro wrestler. Tell you no, know, I didn't. We didn't know how, how popular you were. You know, anytime I get a set, they're doing that, and um, you know, you really garner a lot of respect because not only do we know how to perform live, we know how to work in front. You know, in we're improv specialists. We, we know how to work cameras. You know, when I get behind a set, I'm talking about okay, put that camera here. I like want to shoot it this way, and they're like, how the hell did you learn all this shit? You just did. <laughs> Well, you know, once people figured out that punk rock is real rock and roll music and pro wrestlers are the greatest one take actors in the world, I hello. think things sort of changed. You know what I mean? Hello, it's hello, like hello. I, we just talked a little bit about punk rock today. I was talking to my wife about it, punk rock, and I was saying I was doing your your um, your um podcast, and I was like, you know, Rancid, she's like, yeah, I know, I, I know the name, and I saw I played a couple of songs. She's like, oh, yeah, totally. She's like, that's like, I, I always thought of punk rock, like, you know, it's like, I it goes, no, punk is awesome. It's like, combination of ska and just there's so it's just different you know like i listen to stuff like the day kennedys and stuff from back in the day and i'm like it's really it's really great music man it's really good and it just had that stigma back in the day with oh, you're 100 you know what i mean but that's, and, but that's the thing i think that's where we draw the connection because wrestlers were were fucking carnies you know what i mean they, right. they were like you know if you saw a pro wrestler in a movie it'd always be like a horror movie or a b film or something yeah. like that. Like, like, look at this one. I mean, this is an OG original poster, but Santo, I mean, how many movies did he make? I mean, yeah, that millions, was my, right? uh, that's my dad's godfather, by the way. <laughs> oh shit. Oh well, yeah. This is, a, this is an original actually poster. I, I, I bought it probably about 25, not longer years ago. There was used to be a poster shop on Hollywood Boulevard. I don't even think it's there anymore. And when I came across it and you would probably laugh what I paid for it. But right. now I see these things. They're all there's a lot of these reprints. But I have a bunch of these old Santo posters. Oh, that's but, awesome. But you know, one of the things I was gonna say, uh, gonna ask, you know, the the lucha libre style is sort of one of those things that I think that's in everybody today. You know what I mean? And Absolutely. that that Mexican wrestling, the Southern California. I feel like that in California in general. I would say. I feel like that style, that West Coast style, which is very lucha libre, is in everybody's style these days. Who would you say is, if, if there was maybe two or three guys that, you know, current, maybe that are no longer wrestling or whatever, who would you give those, what three guys would you give credit for making that much of an impact with the lucha style? So what you're saying, it's kind of like MMA a little bit. Everybody's a hybrid now. Back in the day in MMA, you had, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu versus karate, you know, uh, sambo wrestler versus striker. Now everybody's got to be a hybrid because you got to have be able to kind of do everything. But in pro wrestling, there's three guys that were very, very instrumental in bringing what you see and making wrestling the way it is today. And that's Eddie Guerrero, Dean Malenko, and Chris Benoit. And that's when the, all three of them came in from you know wrestling in, go to wcw and they were in ecw together they were in japan they were in mexico and they could do all those different styles everybody was like what the heck is this and then you know ray mysterio followed and chris jericho followed and lucia doors followed and everybody was like well, this is a completely different style but even though we've known that forever they're like right. wow we've never seen these moves before and then at the same time i started seeing guys like kane at wwf at the time doing a hurricanrana i'm like what what the where did that come from? My head scissor. I'm like, he's a you know, 300 pound guy. Why? Where did that? You know, now it's integrated into everything. And you got guys that are these big dudes like, you know, Willie Mack and and Brian Cage, and they're doing standing moonsaults and stuff like that. Yeah. That was never done. You know, those that was reserved for the small small luchador style. And now it's kind of it's kind of everywhere. So, like, even if you're you know six four, you're doing moonsaults and you're doing different stuff like that. So it's kind of just all so it's all everything's a hybrid now. 
you know, you know, you got to learn how to mat wrestle. You got to learn how to do spots. You got to learn how to, uh, you know, fly. Uh, you kind of got to be able to do everything now. I'm good. I've got one more question then maybe we'll play a game. Lars and I will discuss it here in a second, but uh, my last question is your podcast. I was a huge fan of your podcast. And then just one day it stops. Uh, I, I don't see it anymore. Uh, a, I know there's, everybody has a podcast and we don't need to have beef with another podcast, but I'd like to see you come back. So we could beef with you. So uh, any plans on reviving the podcast? Because like I said, well, it's going to be like a Guerrero feud, like gringo Guerrero it. versus That's right. Bravo Guerrero. I love it. I love Let's it. go SA. <laughs> all right home. all right all right man i got you man <laughs> so uh what the fuck dennis i don't know <laughs> it's the mustache if, if, no, listen if you were in california you might be able to get away with it but you're you're like in the midwest bro it's like with a stupid yeah. mustache it's yeah, like you look like a, you look like a porn guy <laughs> <laughs> Wait, not, please, not the second a- half of this podcast guys <laughs> You're either a cop or you're or you're a pony guy. <laughs> both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so uh what was your question? <laughs> your podcast. Oh my podcast. So suplexing surfaces with Chavo Guerrero. I started doing that and I had signed with with a with a company and was doing that. And I I I wasn't getting a lot of support from that company. It was almost like I should have just stayed on my own doing it. So that's why I kind of stopped, just because the fact that I wasn't happy with the company that I was with and no big deal. It is what it is. So uh, I ended up um, kind of stopping it for, for a bit. And, uh, you know, I've had a couple of inquiries to start bringing it back and I probably will, if I can, you know, sign with the right company and do that. But it was, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed my, the format was a little bit different for sure, but it was something that I just enjoyed talking to my boys, my friends. So pretty much everybody I talked to on there, I had a personal relationship with. So it was guys, not only from wrestling, like the undertaker, and you know Rey Mysterio, uh, but it was guys like uh, you know like Andrew Yang, you know ex presidential candidate, uh, Gabriel Iglesias, who was uh, you know Fluffy, the you know the uh, um, uh, comedian. You know I I had just all these, and we just, we didn't just talk about wrestling. We just talked about uh, just, it was almost like guys were on a on a, a road trip in a car, and you were overhearing this and them talk. You know, and that I so I really liked that. And my favorite part was just catching up with all with all my peeps, all my my people. You know. Um, so I, I, you know, there's still a whole bunch more other people that I know that I have never interviewed. So we'll see, never know. It may, it'll probably come back at, at some point. Lars, can we skip the game and I ask one follow up question and then you can have the last two questions? Sure. When you go onto a podcast now after doing yours, do you judge? Do you like silently <laughs> judge in the back of your head? Like, oh God, these guys are oh, this, these guys aren't so bad. They're not in their mom's basement. Come on, you can't, tell the help, truth. you can't help but do it sometimes. But at the same time, too, like I don't I don't do, you know, you get a lot of podcast requests. I get probably 10 a week. I really don't do very many of them. I kind of keep it, I kind of pick and choose a little bit. Of course, I was gonna do Lars. Absolutely. But um, you know, it's just you know, they're saying, like I said, everybody has a podcast now. So sometimes you got guys that are in their basement, mom's basement with you know, 800 listeners. So you're like, ah, I probably won't do that one. So um do you judge them a little bit? I guess you do a little bit, but sometimes I'm not a judgy guy. I would like, I like to, if they need help, I just jump in and just take over and start leading it a little bit. It's just who I am. You know, if I'm going to be here, let's have a good interview. Well, one of the things I just kind of wanted to just go back and correct myself because I do realize that like guys like Mark Henry and Jerry Lynn are, you know, in those producer roles. Sure, sure. I know, I know, you know, I want to make broad sure subject. I, there's a broad, you broad, yeah, yeah. Broad, you're still, you're still some really good guys up there. Sure. One, 100%. I mean, and, and true professionals, I guess for me, you know, I hate those legacy questions, right. But you yeah. know, when you think about what your family has done, what you've been a part of, what you've seen, why hasn't there been a book? Uh, on the Guerrero's or on Chavo or on what? on Chavo, because I feel like you have a unique perspective because I mean, you know, you know, listen, you've worked with everybody. You've tagged with your, your pops, you tagged with Eddie. I mean, you know, you've had a single, it's like, you have a unique perspective. I know everybody would maybe want the, you know, the undertaker book, but like, we've seen that we haven't, we don't really know Chavo. So what's, what's going on with that? You know, my story is still being written, man. It's still being written. You know, some people have approached me on that, but I think, 
excuse me. I think that I'll, uh, you know, eventually everybody writes a book. You know, I'll do something when it's, when my story is still, you know, when it's winding down a little bit, but like I said, it's still being written, man. I, I'm, you know, Jericho was smart to where he kind of wrote his part, his book and stopped it as he was going to WWE. And that just, um, that was his first book. Then his second book was talking about his WWE stuff. So he, he, he was pretty smart that way. You know, uh, I'd have to do something that was just a different thing, you know, not just a regular book, you know, I'd have to think of something different. Like, you know, like when Mick Foley first, his, you know, have a nice day did his, it was kind of a different format. It was pretty cool. And then everybody started following that up a little bit. And then Jericho did his, which was a little bit different. Uh, you know, I don't know. So uh, I, I got to read Brian Gord's book right now because he's talking about his life as a writer in WWE and all the stuff that he saw. So it's a different perspective. So, you know, you get something catchy, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> well, but I mean, that's the thing. It's I've seen you reinvent yourself over the years and, you know, you're always sort of the same, but your style might get it might get a little bit different. The attitude, the character is always evolving. That's one of the things I've always noticed about you. You weren't ever pigeonholed. You could do so many things. You could, you know, that's why I think that that's your angle, right? I don't know. I'm not your manager. I just yeah. want to chop. There's there's, there's many angles out there, so hopefully I'll be able to do some one someday. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes, for sure. But thank you, Chavo. I mean, we we super appreciate your time. It's. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm glad that you were able to make the time for us, man. This is absolutely, man. Cool. I'm glad we, we worked something out, Dennis, and uh, all the days worked out. I'm glad, man. I got to catch up with my boy, and uh, you know, I'm happy for it. So, man, all the all luck to you guys for sure. And uh, I got a bunch of stuff coming up too. So, uh, plug. Well, do please plug yeah, it right before we wrap this thing up. Yeah, definitely yeah. check out my anything on you know on you can follow me on Instagram at Chop Grill Junior. That's kind of where everything's there, but. Uh, you know, I have my beer, Los Guerreros Mexican Lager out. That's doing really well. Um, get ready to go back and film Young Rock season three. Uh, I'm in the middle of talking and making a movie with some very big actors. So uh, yeah, there's a whole lot more coming from me. So keep keep your Sick. keep yeah keep your yeah you know keep peel the and there's always I always have a lot of irons in the fires for sure. So more yeah. stuff coming for sure, man. Well, listen, uh, for everybody at home, the show's over. We'll say our goodbyes off the air. He's Chavo Guerrero Jr. That guy's Lars Fredrickson. I'm Gringo Guerrero. We will see you guys next <laughs> week. Thank you so much, Chavo, for coming and hanging out with Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it, man. Anytime. Thank and good luck you, to you guys. Talk soon. Thank you.